Good morning. Great to be with you this morning and great to have the privilege of uh, opening God's Word, opening the Bible and uh, having a bit of a conversation or a, or a chat about what it means. It's going to be less conversational, I guess. I've, I've oversold that a little bit. I'm going to talk for a little bit. But let it not be a, a, a one-sided thing or a one-way thing. This isn't from me to you and then that's it. This is from God to us. I'm hoping he might use me for that. But let's, uh, let's each ask God to speak to us in a meaningful and a powerful way this morning. Amen? Amen. Very good, very good. Um, we are starting a new series uh, here at Gold Hill in these mornings. In both our 8.15 and our 10 o'clock service, we are starting a series looking at the book of James. Uh, if you don't have one of these, uh, the, these little booklets, one of these, uh, these uh, accompanying materials, please do, uh, do ask one of the welcome team who are coming around with them now and with some Bibles. And uh, this series on the book of James, we've called Just Do It. Of course, Just Do It is a phrase more famously associated with Nike, Nike. Bit of debate about how we pronounce it. I'm going to go with Nike. Um, uh, apparently it's Nike. I'm still going to go with Nike. Um, <laughs> Okay, apparently it's Nike. We'll go with Nike. There we go. Um, I'm happy to accept uh, correction, as, as James has already said today. So, Nike, uh, this phrase, just do it. I want to talk for a moment about that. Uh, anyone, anyone heard of a guy called Colin Kaepernick? I have. I'm going to talk about it. There we go. A few people have. Colin Kaepernick um, was a, uh, a quarterback in the NFL, the National Football League in, in the States. And uh, this year he's caused a bit of a fuss. There's been quite a lot of media coverage, quite a lot of people talking about Colin Kaepernick. Because earlier this year he decided that he was no longer going to stand during the National Anthem at uh, National Football League games. Uh, at American football games, and uh, he was instead going to, he was going to kneel, he was going to take a, take a knee. And uh, he did this in an attempt to try and uh, raise some awareness and, and stand in, uh, or kneel in solidarity with what he sees as, uh, as black Americans who are treated un unfairly, who are treated poorly, who are not treated in the same way as white Americans. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about the ins and outs and the specifics of that particularly. Um, I, I am not an expert in race relations in, the, in America, and one thing that I do believe is what race relations in the world needs less of is uninformed white people talking about things they don't know anything about, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I, I'm also not a particularly a fan of American football, and I am not an American, so I don't feel as though I'm best placed to talk about all of this. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Bible. Um, the reason I bring him up is that Colin Kaepernick uh, has, has recently become the new face of Nike. And uh, he has, he's sort of uh, fronted a bunch of adverts and he's, he's doing all right. And, and one of these adverts, he, he's, he, they're inspiring adverts. They're trying, to, they're trying to get you to think outside the box, to dream bigger, and ultimately to buy a pair of trainers. But there, 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 are, the, there are these inspiring messages that show sports people who've come from against the odds and made it. Someone who's uh, had a disability and who's still made it to the top of their sport. Someone who's, who's been a refugee and has still made it to the top of their sport. All of these inspiring stories. And if you, if you watch one of these, uh, uh, the, the, the latest uh, Nike advert, um, which is fronted by Colin Kaepernick, he says this. He says, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that this guy means that, because he did believe in something, enough to do something about it, and it cost him an awful lot. He's not been signed this year. For, for, for a team. He's, he's no longer able to play in the NFL because of the choices that he's made, because he believed in something to the point of sacrificing everything. So the question I want to ask is, the things that we believe as Christians, for those of you here today who are Christians, who are followers of Jesus, what is it you believe in enough to sacrifice everything? What is it you believe in enough to do something about it? I believe that faith has to look like something. Faith needs to be outworked in our life. Faith is not just about us sitting by ourselves alone in a room, believing things and having good doctrine. That is an important part of faith. But faith has to look like something in our lives. It has to take shape. It has to be embodied in who we are and in the way that we behave. That's why in these, in, in these uh, notes th th this time round, we've produced similar notes for things in the past. There's some study notes to, to look at. But then for each week, there's a section that I've, that I've called just, just do it. And there are in there each week two suggestions of things that you can do, 
with what we're talking about, with what we're exploring. Some of them are really, really intensely practical. Some of them are more sort of exercises that you can do in your home or, or, or various different things. They're all rooted in prayer. But these are things that we can be doing. Because if we are just hearing stuff or reading stuff and, and learning more, but never doing something with it, if what we believe in is not enough to motivate us to do something, then we've missed the trick somewhere along the way. So that's why we've called this series Just Do It, because James is all about faith in action. Faith is a practical book. Uh, sorry, James is a practical book. James is all about doing something as a result of what we believe about Jesus Christ. Sometimes in the book of James, the, the, the encouragements are, are kind of a, come on guys, just do it. Sometimes he's laying it very clearly on the line and saying, you just need to do this, guys. This is not difficult. Go and do it. At other points, he's a lot more gentle and soft and, and caring. And it's more a kind of, go on, just do it. Go for it. You can do this. I believe in you. At times, it's, it's more firm. At times, it's more gentle. And as we kick off in the book of James, it starts off a lot more gentle. Today's much more of a, go for it. Keep on going kind of message. So I want to I read the first 11 verses of James chapter 1. James chapter 1, starting at the beginning, we read this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter being double-minded and unstable in every way must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low. Because the rich will disappear like a flower in the fields. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. It is the same with the rich in the midst of a busy life. They will wither away. James then goes on to talk about temptation and where temptation comes from. Does it come from God or does it come from somewhere else? And all good things do come from God, but we're not going to look at that bit this morning. We're going to look at those first 11 verses. And really, this is James encouraging the people to keep on going, to keep on pressing on, to keep on persevering in their, in, in their faith, to keep on going. So I, I just want to give three, three things that we can, we can try and build into our life. Three aspects of keeping on going that come from these verses. They're very simple. One is about perseverance. One is about prayer. And one is about our perspective. It starts off with, uh, with perseverance in verse 2 and 4. Uh, two, sorry, 2 to 4. And James, James is encouraging people at times when they face trials. He says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. What are these kind of trials that they would have been facing? As, as we look through the book of James as a whole, we get a sense that the people he's writing to are predominantly quite poor. They are not wealthy. They're not well-to-do. They don't have a lot of stuff. They are struggling. They're probably struggling to make ends meet. There's, there's injustices that are more apparent in their life because of their poverty. They're not doing particularly well in life, and that comes with all kinds of difficulties and hardship. But look in verse 1, who it is that he's writing to. He says, to the 12 tribes, in other words, Jewish people, in the dispersion. What's the dispersion? Well, Jerusalem was the center of the Jewish faith and it was the center of Christian faith because that's where Jesus died and was resurrected and where the church initially formed. When the church started to be persecuted, Christians ended up having to scatter all over the place. And so they were dispersed, sometimes known as the diaspora, sometimes known as the dispersion, depending on your translation. But so it's talking about Christians and Jewish Christians who have come to know Jesus, who are poor and who have been scattered because of persecution, who are no longer surrounded by lots of like minded people because they've had to run. They've had to flee and they've had to settle places that are further away from Jerusalem. Some of these people may already have been outside of Jerusalem when they came to faith. But either way, they are sort of disconnected from their, their spiritual home and their spiritual root. So those are the kind of trials that they would have been facing. What kind of trials are you facing? Are they the material kind of trials of finding things difficult, like the poverty that these people were facing? 
Are there relational trials that you're, that you're facing? Are there difficulties in your finances, difficulties in your families, difficulties in your workplaces? Are there things that every morning you wake up and go, oh, I've got to face that again. Maybe they are more on the, the spiritual realm, like, the, like these people who are disconnected from that root, who are struggling, who are feeling maybe confused in their faith and don't quite know where their roots are anymore. Where is it that you're struggling and what is it that we can do to find perseverance in the midst of that? Paul says that we should consider it joy, that there's actually joy in the midst of those trials and those suffering. That doesn't immediately make sense to us because it feels as though trials should be a thing that is no joy whatsoever. But actually he says there can be joy because of a process that can happen because of it. He says, the testing of your faith produces endurance, much like a, a muscle that is used again and again and again, lifting weights or doing a, whatever it is or going for a run or continually using that same muscle. That muscle will build endurance. If you continue to use something, it will grow. And at the times when our, when our faith is tested, at the times when it is difficult, there is an opportunity for that faith to actually grow because under that pressure and under that strain, it can build up. But then he says, and let that endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. That endurance can lead to character. Or rather, that endurance will lead to character. The question is, what kind of character will we let it produce in us? Going back to that image of a, a muscle being strained under lifting weights, the muscle will build what the person who owns that muscle then chooses to do with it is their choice. Whether they, they use that increased muscle for good or whether they use it to beat someone up is entirely up to them. When our faith is tested, it will have an effect on our faith. It's a kind of sink or swim thing. And we, we, we may build that, that energy and that, and that capacity and it may, it may grow our faith. But the question is, where do we then take that? Do we allow those trials to produce in us bitterness and resentment and grief? Or do we allow those trials to produce in us character and godliness and perseverance and hope when suffering comes our way or when difficulties come our way how do we persevere and where do we let that turn where do we let that make us turn do we immediately turn towards everything that's bad or do we immediately turn back to god when trials come james encourages us to allow that to produce endurance and to produce character and to produce maturity but for that to happen, we need to turn to God. We need to turn to him in the midst of that because he's the one that can give us endurance. And he's the one that can give us character and completeness and maturity. That's why, uh, having spoken about this perseverance, James goes immediately to talk about prayer. In verse 5 to 8, he talks about this. He says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. Notice it's, it's wisdom that he's, that, that he's saying people should be asking for. In, in those situations when trials come and difficulties arise, often the reason that we can struggle and we don't know what to do is that we don't have the wisdom for the new situation we find ourselves in. Wisdom is knowing what to do in our lives. Wisdom is the art of living well. Wisdom is taking the knowledge that we have and applying it for the situations we find ourselves in. It's how to live, how to live well. How to, know, how to know how to keep on going when trials come. That's the kind of thing that we need to look to God for. I am not wise by myself. I may have some wisdom, may have some good ideas, but I'm not wise. And, and, and nor are you, at least not compared with God. God is the ultimate wisdom. He, he, he made this world. He made you. He knows how the two are meant to go together. He knows everything. He knows what your life can look like and should look like. He's willing for you to live that way. He wants for you to live that way. But we have to go to him to ask instead of trying to muster our own wisdom and do it by ourselves. He says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, which is all of us, ask God who gives generously and ungrudgingly. Then he talks about something which sounds quite negative, sounds like, almost like he's pointing a finger at the people in the book of James. And, and actually, as, as, as you read through the rest of the book of James, you start to get a picture of why this might be that, that James was saying about this. Because he says, but ask in faith 
Then he goes on to talk about not doubting and, uh, and not sort of going to and fro and being tossed this way and that way and being double-minded. He says, if you ask with that kind of attitude, you're never going to receive wisdom. But if you ask in faith, then you will. What I don't believe James is saying is that if, if we ever waver in our faith, if we ever have these, these moments of doubt and we have questions and we aren't quite sure where God is in all of it, then suddenly God's no longer interested and he doesn't want to work with us anymore. What James is talking about is a, is a consistent approach to life which says, yeah, I'll look to God for some things, but I'm going to look to the world for other things. Later on in the book of James, Abraham is held up as this example of what faith looks like, as someone who didn't waver and someone who didn't doubt. But we look at the life of Abraham and we see times when he definitely fell, times when he definitely messed up, times when he thought, this doesn't seem to be going the right way. I'm going to take matters into my own hand. Sarah doesn't seem to be producing me a child. I guess I'll go to her slave, Hagar. Abraham did waver and he did doubt, and yet he still held up as an example of faith. Why? Because if you look at the whole trajectory of his life, he was someone who overall persistently trusted in God. You wavering, you having a bad day in your faith does not disqualify you from God giving you wisdom for the next day at all. What James is talking about is a persistent lifestyle that says, yeah, I'm going to look to God for some things and the world for other things. It's kind of lifestyle that says, yeah, I, 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 think, I've got, I think I've got most of my life on track. 70% of my life, I know what I'm doing with. I know that because I've been taught well, I've been parented well, I've got all of these things, and 70% of my life, yep, I know what I'm doing. The 30% of my life, I don't know what I'm doing in. I look to God for that. That's not the kind of way that, that James is encouraging us to live. James is encouraging at the root, at the base, every single decision in your life, every single aspect of your life, are you going to God and saying, what does your approach to, to life look like in that sphere? I've been thinking quite a lot recently about money. Because it'll, it's no surprise to anyone that in our society and in our, in our culture, money is one of the biggest idols. Money is one of the biggest things that, that, that can distract people from a relationship with God and a faith in God. In fact, James goes on to talk a little bit about wealth in a moment. But as I've been looking at it, I've been, I've been looking for something. And it might be that someone here can help me out because I've been looking for something and I can't find it. I've been looking for a resource or a, or, or, a, or a course or a teaching series or something that is all about helping Christians to approach their money well. And as I've looked around and as I've Googled and as I've studied and as I've tried to find something that exists for that, what I've found is that you can find loads of Christian courses on giving, mostly to your church, and you can find loads of Christian courses that are about helping those who don't have much money to handle their finances well. Those are great things. Look at things like uh, CAP, Christians Against Poverty, helping people who are in debt to be able to come out of debt. That is a great thing, and that is a gospel thing. Look at the, uh, the, the HTB money course. Again, it's helping people who are maybe struggling to manage their finances well to apply good, sound financial practices to their finance so that they can save a bit, so that they can, they, they, they can build up a little bit of money, so that they can invest it well, and they can, they, they can make ends meet. What I'm yet to find is something that says, for Christians who are not struggling with their finances, for Christians who are well off, or for Christians who are just in that middle bracket somewhere, how is it that we should be approaching our money? What would Jesus say about our money? About our giving, about our earning, about our sacrificing, about what we do with the money we don't give? I can't find it. I've been looking. I can't find it. It may be that someone's sitting there going, well, I know where it is, I'll tell them where it is. But I think sometimes our emphasis is to say, we know what, we know how money works because we live in a world that's fairly money savvy. If we want to approach our finances well and sensibly and with good sound financial planning, we go to a great sound financial planning advice place like County Financial. Maybe Andy's sitting there going, I know what Dave needs. <laughs> and those are great things. But actually, when, when you talk to Andy, and I hadn't planned to talk about this, but I saw you and I thought I would. When you talk to Andy, his emphasis is not just on helping people to use good, sound financial planning in order to manage their, their resources well. It's helping people to use their money well, to use it in good ways, to use it for good things, not just to sit on this nest egg. So that's all about money, just as one example of where do we look to for our wisdom? Are there things that in our lives are actually kind of off limits to where we look to God for our wisdom. There are things where we go, I, I've got that. I know that. I've got that sussed. 
And it's kind of like we're holding on to God for the bits we need God for, and we're holding on to something else, our, 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 our worldly knowledge or our self-help books or our YouTube tutorials or whatever it is for the rest of our life. And actually, we're holding on to two things which may not be saying the same thing. God wants us to hold on with two hands to him, to look to him for every source of wisdom in our life, to pray that he would make us wise and that he would help us, help us to live every single aspect of our life well. We persevere. When we don't know how to persevere, we pray and ask that God would make us wise. But the final thing that I think James sort of talks about here in verses 9 to 11 is that we would have a godly perspective about our lives and about our status. He compares a poor person and a rich person. And he says, let the believer who is lowly or poor, the, the word does carry sort of financial connotations, let the, let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low. It seems to be contradictory. Someone who's poor needs to boast in being raised up and someone who's rich needs to boast in being made low. But for a poor person, for someone who does not have much, to be given the identity of being a child of God is to be taken from being seen as nothing, being seen as very little in the world's eyes, being seen as not bringing much to the table, and, 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 and to go from that place to being elevated to being called a child of the king of heaven. That is something worth boasting in. Doesn't mean they stop being poor. Doesn't mean they're lifted from that poverty. It means that their identity is not there anymore. They are boasting in the fact that they have been elevated from being a nothing to being a something. For the rich person who is boasting in being brought low, it's because actually in the world's eyes they are a something. They have something. They've made it. They've got there. They've got the badge. They've got the seal of approval. In order for them to accept Jesus, they've got to recognize that those things count for nothing. That even though the world might see them as a something, that actually all of that is nothing. And in order to be a something, they've got to let that go. Doesn't mean they're no longer rich. Doesn't mean they're no longer well off. Doesn't mean any of that means their identity is not there anymore. So the same thing is actually being said for both, that whether we have little or whether we have much, if we are in Jesus, we have everything. And our previous identity didn't matter at all. It changes our perspective. And James goes on to give some, some reasons why that's important, because he says, basically, look, just like the sun coming up and, and scorching the plants and then they're gone, life is fickle and life is fragile and life is transitory and things fade away. Your money doesn't define you. In fact, nothing defines you apart from who you are in Jesus because he's made you his brother or sister. He's made you God's son. Look at the very first verse of James 1. How does James introduce himself? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know who James is on a human level? This James who wrote this book is Jesus' brother. His actual earthly physical brother. Mary was both of their mums. And yet he doesn't hold that as a badge. He doesn't go, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Jesus's brother, so listen to what I'm saying. How does he label himself? A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even his earthly biological connection to Jesus, something that literally only six other people max in the world could possibly have held on to, doesn't matter. That is not his identity. His only identity is that he is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God. What are the things that you allow to define you, that you use as a badge, either positively or negatively? This, 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 this thing that you hold up as, I've made it and I am a something because I've got this. If that thing is gripping you and holding you in a way that means you can't say anything other than, I'm just a servant of Jesus. I'm, his, I'm a child of God. That's all you need to know about me. Then there's something holding you back from pressing on and keeping on going in this faith. And if there's something that you think disqualifies you and makes you a nothing and makes you not worth anything and makes you not worth anything in the eyes of the world, 
And that is stopping you from being able to say, I don't care what you think. I'm a child of God. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Then there is something that is holding you back from pursuing and persevering and keeping on going in the life that Jesus is calling you to. James starts his letter with these encouragements. Persevere. When you face trials, let them build character in your life. Turn to God and ask him for wisdom in everything. And don't let things that really don't matter and that are going to fade away define you. When the one person who will never fade away has said that he wants to define you already. For me, that's an encouragement to keep on going. In one way or another, these all involve sacrifice. If we believe what Jesus has done for us, then we need to be willing to sacrifice something for it. Just like Colin Kaepernick says in an advert trying to sell you trainers. Someone far better and far bigger and far more powerful has been saying that to his followers for centuries and centuries and centuries. If what I've done in your life is true, let it affect everything. Let it change the very person that you are. Let it change the very way that you see yourself. And that is how you can keep on going. Because everything else that comes doesn't matter as much as that. And so we can press on and we can keep on going and we can persevere. Knowing that God who is wisdom and who gives wisdom and who is strength and who gives strength will keep us and hold us and draw us on. Everything fades except Jesus. Hold on to something that will last. Let me pray. Father God, Guy prayed earlier on that everything pales into insignificance in comparison with you. May that be true in our lives. May everything fade away. May everything be peeled away and fade back into the background. Except for the single truth of knowing you. And from the ground up, from the inside out, would that be the thing that shapes us? Would you give us the boldness and the courage to let our faith, what we know to be true of you, change us and impact us and shape us? Help us to be just do it people who are willing to move when you ask, who are willing to be different, who are willing to stand out. Lead us on, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.